In this video, we will define transverse and longitudinal waves, define electromagnetic radiation, define wavelength, frequency, and amplitude, and then identify the relationships between wavelength and frequency. We'll calculate the frequency from the wavelength and vice versa, and then we'll introduce the basics of wave interference. And then we'll work on differentiating between destructive and constructive interference. There are two types of waves, as well as some blended versions that we aren't going to discuss now. A transverse waves includes things like light waves, or if you pluck a guitar string, while longitudinal waves include sound and pressure waves. We'll be spending all of our time on this chapter on transverse waves. Electromagnetic radiation is a large part of our daily lives. For this chapter, we just need to define it a bit better and talk about some specific properties. Examples in our daily lives include things like heat, microwaves, sunlight, X-rays? Can you think of any other things that are considered electromagnetic radiation? Other examples that you may have thought of are radio waves, whether that be AM, FM, or TV, gamma rays from space, cell phone signals, garage door openers, remote controls. The possibilities are endless. Now let's talk about some specific things that you'll need to be able to identify and calculate about electromagnetic radiation. We can talk about amplitude here, although we won't be doing a lot of calculations with it for electromagnetic radiation. But amplitude is just half the distance from the crest to the trough, or in other words, from the highest point to the lowest point. Things that we will be working with continually, though, are wavelength and frequency. Wavelength is the distance that it takes to go one full rotation of the wave. Here it is shown from this point to this point. Frequency may be a bit tougher to picture. It's the amount of cycles of a wave that occur in one second. I find students have an easier time visualizing it with spinning. Stand up for a second and spin around in a circle a few times. If that took you one second to do one cycle, then you're doing one cycle per second, or as we might call it, one hertz. Let's say that maybe you were going a bit faster and you were doing two spins for every one second. Now you'd be spinning at two hertz. The same works when looking at a wave. If it goes from here to here in one second, then it has a frequency of one hertz. If it does two of those in one second, then it would have a frequency of two hertz, and so on and so forth. Given that we know the speed of light, we're able to convert between frequency and wavelength. Something to be a bit careful about here is that new or the symbol for frequency, is going to look an awful lot like V. And with the difference in computer fonts, it's often nearly impossible to tell the two apart simply by looking at them. You're going to need to pay attention to the context clues in the problem to make sure that you know which one is frequency and which one is velocity. And then one last thing that we sort of already covered, but one more time more formally, the units of frequency is inverse seconds, or in other words, one over seconds, and we often call that hertz. So that's shortened to HZ, pronounced hertz. Electromagnetic waves are actually made of two components with an electrical and a magnetic component that have the same properties such as wavelength and frequency, but are perpendicular to each other. As with all irradiation, this they travel at the speed of light. We won't be covering this concept much more other than this. We can just work with it as if it is one of these waves. Wavelength and frequency, which we're soon going to see determined energy, is what decides the properties of a wave. This is what distinguishes different types of electromagnetic radiation that we talked about at the beginning of this video. Let's look at how energy and frequency and wavelength are related. If wavelength increases, what happens to the frequency? Keep in mind that light travels at the same speed, and you can use the picture here to help you. Pause the video if you need a minute to think about it. If we increase the wavelength, then the frequency must decrease. Let's answer another question. The different wavelengths and frequencies of light can be measured through instruments, including in some cases our eyes. We see one area of the spectrum aptly named the visible region. Let's look at the differences between two colors, red and blue. Which of the two has a greater frequency? You can take a minute and pause and look at the picture if you need help. 
if we're talking about frequency, you can look and see that the blue has the higher frequency. Looking at the spectrum, which has the greater energy? We'll be talking more about energy in other videos as well. You can see from the picture that the blue also has the higher energy. Now look at both of them and which one has the greater speed, blue light or red light? Since we know the speed of light is C, we know that both blue light, red light, actually all forms of light are gonna have that same speed. And so it's not gonna be blue light or red light. They're both gonna have the same speed as well as all the other ones. Let's do one example where we interchange between frequency and wavelength. Let's practice some good problem solving techniques as well. We'll write out all of the things that we need to know to relate that relate to this problem and what we want to know. Given that we have an equation that converts between the known and unknown quantity, we know that we can fill in our known quantities to the equation that we have. Since C is in meters and wavelength is in nanometers, we'll need to convert to make sure that we're in the same unit. Though technically you could use either unit, I'm going to convert nanometers into meters. I like using the base unit the best. From here, we take our 522, divide by our 10 to the 9th nanometers to get our final meters value. Make sure that you know how to do all of these metric conversions. If you need a reminder, you can see the other videos, your book, the internet, or visit office hours to get extra help. We can now fill into the equation and solve for our final answer. It might be a good idea to still cross out the meters to make sure that our units cancel. If you had forgotten to convert between meters, this would help you recognize your mistake. We'll also double check for sig figs. We have three in the initial problem, so we held out our C, and we can round and solve for our final answer. I'd like to end now with a little comic to help you remember the visible region of the spectrum. Though you don't need to memorize that entire spectrum, it is useful to know some very various parts of it. So if you can read through the comic, you can see that the boy comes in and he asks for various colors of what we would think of as red bull, except that he's asking for blue bull or green bull or yellow bull. And every time the cashier is confused and says, no, 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 no. And then the kind of punchline and joke about the whole thing is he's talking to his friend and he's like, oh man, I was hoping for something a little higher energy because red is actually the lowest energy of the colored or the visible region of the spectrum. And it's a silly comic, but it might help you to remember at least the visible region's order. We're gonna sort of switch topics into a little bit of a subtopic and talk about wave interference. Waves will interfere with each other when they come into contact. A great way of being able to picture this is thinking about what occurs when you drop two pebbles in a pond. The ripples will come in contact with each other, making new patterns that are very different from simple circles. The same thing can happen with light waves, and this is gonna be really important for the next several chapters. Now let's look at this interaction a little bit more closely and more correctly phrased. Think back to your early math days when you had to add two waves together. You may remember having to go point by point and add them to show that you what the new wave looked like. If we start here and then move to the second part, to the second wave, and we add those together, we'll, we are still at zero. But now let's move to the blue stars. If you add those up, now it's gonna go up double the distance. And we could arbitrarily call each one of those one and then it would add to be two. That's called constructive interference. This gives us a wave that is larger than the two waves that we started with. There's another kind of interference though, and that's destructive interference. This happens in a way where the wave cancels out. In this example, not only does the first data point still add to zero, but if you look at the second one, so does that. If we once again arbitrarily can call the peak one and the trough negative one, you can see that a peak and a trough are gonna add together to equal zero. This is called destructive interference. 
it's also possible to get incomplete interference. In this example, we can see that a trough is only half as deep as the crest that it is aligned with. This means that there will still be interference and it will still be destructive, but our final wave will still have a peak of one. If we arbitrarily were to call the top, um, the top peak two and the bottom trough a negative one. Of course, you could pick any numbers for these, but ones are easy to add. This can also be both constructive and destructive, or both depending on the phase. Now you know that electromagnetic radiation have an electronic and magnetic component. Wavelength, frequency, and energy of waves are related by the equations E equals h nu and E equals hc over lambda. Waves can interact in a way that add, which is called constructive, or subtract, which is called destructive.